This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Jamie Catania, D, 5, 4. Initiate, part 2. Yeah, let's, let's, well, let's, let's talk about this because, so I grew up with these up until the 90s or so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's been, there have been some reboots, uh, some, some that I'm not, just didn't resonate with me as much, some that really, really did in different time frames and time periods. Um, which which happened with all the characters yeah. in the DC universe, really. But let's talk about this because it's complicated, right? So you start out with the 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 adventure comics kind of superhero club era of the Legion, and that's, right. that's very much what they. They literally had a clubhouse yeah, that looked like, like a rocket crashed into the ground. Yeah, and even the origin of that alone has been retconned six or seven times, <laughs> just to give you a sense of where of how complicated we're we're getting here with this. <laughs> but so you've got the classic lineup, which is you've got Cosmic Boy, Saturn Girl, and Lightning Lad, the the founding members. And right. then the two after it are uh, Triplicate Girl and Phantom Girl. One one can split into three bodies. The other girl can phase. And you've got your Chameleon Boy is a shapeshifter. Colossal Boy who can grow super big. Visible Kid, pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> okay. Star Boy was originally kind of a Superboy parody with all of Superboy's powers plus some other stuff. And then later they're like, no, 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 he can just do gravity. It's fine. Right, so he could make things heavier. Uh-huh. Light last could make things lighter. Yep. Which there's actually a, an arc that Jamie and I were talking about where they kind of figure out like, uh, yeah, being able to manipulate gravity, mm-hmm. that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Let's use those abilities. These aren't just like, oh, look, you're a little bit lighter. No. Yeah. What? <laughs> that That is a recurring point in the, the three-boot Legion, which makes no sense to anyone right now, but we'll get to it, right. uh, where Brainiac 5 is just... Uh, uh, in, infuriated by the fact that a party girl like Light Lass has been granted one of the ability or the ability to negate one of the fundamental forces of the universe and right. uses it as a party trick, right? And this was the second Star Boy, third Star Boy. Uh, I believe Tom Kalor was the first Star Boy, and and to my knowledge only, he later becomes one of the uh, many Star Men. Which is, oh. a, which is its own legacy connected to the Justice Society of America and also some random space gaze. It's, okay, yeah. I, I won't. Uh, I won't. Uh, yeah, you you keep going where you're going. I won't. Uh, I won't. I won't no, interrupt no, there on that. So and and like we said, there's a lot of legionnaires. So just running really quickly, we've also we've got Brainiac Five. He's descended from the the supervillain Brainiac, the Superman villain you may know of. He's just smart. He's a very smart level twelve intelligence with a force field belt, and he's like the strategy guy. We've got Supergirl. Shrinking Violet can shrink. Sun Boy can generate solar energy. Bouncing Boy can kind of expand into a bouncing ball and like absorb kinetic energy, you know, and ricochet and impact and all of that kind of stuff. Ultra Boy's got all of the uh, Kryptonian powers, but can only use them one at a time. Monel's got only all of the Kryptonian powers, but instead of Kryptonite, he's vulnerable to lead. So he's right. been living in the Phantom Zone for a thousand years because and he gets- got poisoned. Correct. Right. Yeah, we got Matter Eater Lad who can eat matter. <laughs> You've got Element Lad who can change elements, Lightning Lass, Light Lass with the lightning or gravity, um, Dream Girl who can dream the future. So it's a lot of like power description, gender identifier, generic costume. Here you go. Right. And then eventually over time they start to develop like Dream Girl's culture is actually quite fascinating. Hugely fascinating. Huge fascinating thing. And then her sister becomes a member of a new later oh, version of the Legion, Lisa. which is yeah, the and called the White Witch. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they have this mixture of technology and magic and all of these things come in. One of the Legion's uh, biggest villains is a, is a, is a wizard named Mordu, uh, who is actually a, like literally a giant wizard. Yes, <laughs> also a Lord of Chaos. Right. There you go. So, so there's, there's some tie-ins here. And it's not just a science fiction future. It's actually quite varied and interesting in all these worlds that are created. One of the many reasons why Legion has always been one of my absolute favorite corners of the DC universe, because yeah. I want everything. I, I do not do not give me something where you tell me magic and science cannot exist together. I want wizards fighting aliens. Right. Also, reference point, Ultra Boys, Homeworld, Rimbor. Yeah. So remember when uh, the, the Justice League season, towards the end of season one, we, we go on that rampage, they're controlled by the light, 
devastating the planet. And that's Rimbor where they end up going for that tribunal. And Rich, right. I know, has been having thoughts about this since the word Rimbor was said yes, on air. Yes, absolutely. And I'm like, what yeah. is happening with this? Yeah. And uh, we've talked about, we, Jamie and I talked about this recently, but this this kind of echo of uh, Amazo's powers in the first season in the comics, Amazo typically can have all the powers at the same time. So he's super speed like Flash, and he's got Superman strength, and he's got the heat vision. And he doesn't, you know. But in Young Justice, largely I think because as well, it's more narratively interesting. He can only have one power at a time. Mm-hmm. But the one power at a time thing is super echoey of Ultra Boy to start with, and then we have Rimbor, and then I was like, and I'm off to the races with my tinfoil hat, and I am going <laughs> to town. I think you also mentioned uh, that that Brandon Vietti had worked pretty extensively on the, the Legion yes. animated show. And yes, he did. while Ultra Boy as a Legionnaire was never more than a background character, the one episode that he did feature somewhat prominently in was before he became a Legionnaire. He was a competitor in this like Galactic Olympics that Lightning right. Lad was also participating in. And in that episode, he was also showcased as having to shout out his abilities ahead of time like... Uh, Amazo does in the Young Justice comic. Nice. So it was Ultra Vision, Ultra right. Breath, right. you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And so I, I just, that that was an echo of like, all right, this is a device we like to use, Brandon. I, I see you. <laughs> right. I got it. So yeah, the, the, the Silver Age Legion is, I don't know, for me, I don't have a ton of patience for the Silver Age. I read a lot of that stuff um, because it was kind of like, what was available it was it was cheap when i was a kid to get those omnibuses of the the, the silver age stuff yeah. i had the the historical the, yeah i had right. the, the hal jordan green lantern omnibus i had the like og you know original five teen titans omnibus all of that stuff and you know i don't have it anymore i gave it to my cousin's young son to read and kind of like pass a lot of that on the legion omnibus i held on to <laughs> because the legion is the best of the silver age to me it's it's I don't know if it's the far flung future setting and the way that they free themselves a little bit from just like the laborious uh, grounding that 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 the Silver Age can sometimes have in modern continuity, but it's like they just get weird with it. They get yeah. really weird, <laughs> and it's weird. kind of amazing. Like the uh, there there's so much weirdness that we couldn't really touch on all of it, but like Bouncing Boy's origin, Bouncing Boy alone, the the character is just you know he bounces like that in a, in and of itself. He's basically like if he was uh, like Mister Fantastic or Plastic Man, but he had only the one power yeah. to turn him to inflate himself into a bouncing ball. Uh, the fact I I have a soft spot in my heart for Bouncing Boy anyway. Also, he ends up marrying Triplicate Girl, mm-hmm. uh, who is an awesome character. But what I found particularly entertaining was in that Legion of Superheroes animated series that was one of their choices. Chuck Tane was one of the characters they said we've got to have Bouncing Boy in this and he is a great take as opposed to like the Brainiac which I actually like now that I've seen the series a few times the Brainiac is good but at first I was like I'm not sure this android Brainiac is strange like do you really know the Legion kind of a thing the Bouncing Boy I was like this Bouncing Boy is kind of rad like he's a pilot and an engineer and a mechanic and like and he's ultimately uh, the the Legion uh, a big convention of them is that their their leaders are elected. Yeah. And actually in the comics, it got to a point where they would let the readership elect the leader. And um, the, the Legion show was pretty short and they didn't have a chance to do as much as I think they probably wanted to. So there's only one leadership election that's ever held. It's and it was Chuck. Yep. And it was Bouncing great. It was really leader. good. Yeah. yeah. But so like his origin... <laughs> We, we get a lot of, like, quick flashback panels for these characters, just like, oh, you know, so-and-so boy just showed up. Let him recount how he got his powers and, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so Bouncing Boy, we see, he was working as a lab assistant for a scientist, and he was supposed to go deliver this ingenious new super plastic fluid to the science ministry for super plastic fluids or something. And he decides to stop at this <laughs> robot fight on the way over, you know, just see the robots fight, because that's what we do. It's the 30th century. Right. And he's like, oh, man, I'm really thirsty. Let me have some of this pop that I have right here because of course the super plastic fluid is in a is bottle shaped exactly that like, looks a like a coke bottle, coke bottle from yeah. the 1950s <laughs> yeah. um, and he and and he you know we see him chugging it and and the moment of that just beautifully drawn like over the top horror on his face and oh no I've accidentally ingested the super plastic fluid like what could happen I'm inflating into a beach ball and then that's how he became a superhero yep and you also get you know there's one of one of the earliest zaniest things of the of the Legion Silver Age that actually becomes one of the 
longest running parts of its continuity to this day is this group called the Legion of Substitute uh, Heroes. I love the subs. They're a great group of characters who, for a variety of reasons, a lot of which are actually very forced, um, a little are, bit. are presented as being not good enough to join the Legion. Right. A lot of their powers are actually really competent, and it's like dumb mistakes that cause them to be considered right. not good enough. Well, so they, they, the Legion would have like, uh, well, whenever it was, you know, it, narratively, narratively interesting. Yeah, narratively interesting. They would have recruitment drives, and so they would have you know teenagers from across the the galaxy show up and do these things. Which I will say, the the audition episodes of the Legion show some of the best. They're always yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, like one of the characters' names is Stone Boy. <laughs> He can turn himself into stone, which sounds pretty powerful, except he's literally can't move. It's not like he's Colossus or like the thing. No, he turns himself into stone and can't move. He's great for a fastball special. Though. He is great for a fastball special. And there's the episode of the Legion of Superheroes of the Minute is pretty funny uh-huh. uh, when they end up using it. Another one was uh, Infectious Lass. Yep. So basically, she's immune to all disease and also carries all disease, a disease powerful enough to make Superboy sick. But she has very little control over how it how right. it affects people and that level of control, right? Another one, one of my absolute favorites is Color Kid, mm-hmm. who can just change the colors of things. Yeah. So these are the kind of characters we're talking about. But there's also Polar Boy yep. and Fire Lad. And where Pol- with Polar Boy, it's literally, I can picture the panel so clearly, it's just he walks in and like tries to demonstrate his power and messes it up a little, like makes Superboy kind of chilly or something. Yeah. And they say, you know, oh, you know, you don't have enough control of your power. You might accidentally freeze us at a critical moment in battle. And then where would we be? Yeah. And it's like, okay, because like yeah. all of you mess up constantly. Right. And right. that's most of your plot. Right. But all right. I guess. And Polar Boy is also typically the leader of the substitute yes. heroes and yeah. is kind of rad. And then there's also so. one of my favorites, Night Girl, Little oh, Jack. Oh, Night Girl's and great. She she is from a planet, K- 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 Thum, something, something like, there's a lot of planets. I'm sorry, <laughs> Legion fans. I, somebody's gonna, you know, um, actually me about this, but uh, her, she comes from a planet that's almost entirely shrouded in darkness. They don't have a typical day and night. It's right. always nighttime. And her father creates this serum for her that gives her Superboy level strength and invulnerability. And it's like, oh, this is great. I'm going to go join the Legion, blah, blah, blah. This is exciting. And they didn't know because their entire planet is always dark. That for some reason, when it's not dark, the strength doesn't work anymore. Right. So, so she's she kind of like the only... opposite, where Superboy's solar powered. Yeah. She's basically night powered. Yes, exactly. So it's like she's got these incredible, she's incredibly powerful, actually, <laughs> but incredibly limited circumstances under which she can use those abilities. Right. Um, which becomes fortunate that later on there's a Legion character called uh, Shadow, Shadow Lass, Lass, and right. they work together very well. Right. So that's just kind of like a hint of like how zany we get with some of that early stuff, and right. then. Things start to mature a little. Um, you know, we get so triplicate girl, the character that can split into three bodies. One of her, t- one of her three bodies is killed in battle against an AI developed by Brainy called Computo. Uh, she becomes Duo Damsel. Um, Computo's a little bit echoey of, and again, this was the '60s mm-hmm. at that point, right? Yeah, that was uh, '66, You're right? So Computo is kind of like the idea of where you get, like, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Tony Stark uh, the create, Ultron, creating yeah. Ultron. It's like. Brainy can creates Computo, and then it turns into a villainous thing. Absolutely, it's it's that kind of that kind of similar trope, and Computo becomes a big and recurring problem. Yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then you also get so I don't, comics fans that are listening are are familiar with the name Jim Shooter, a big writer for Legion, and would go on to become editor in chief at Marvel and make some very good decisions and some extraordinarily questionable decisions. But you know, what, we don't have to get into that. But at 14 years old, a fan of the Legion, he started submitting scripts to DC and actually became the primary writer on the book as a 14 year old. 14 years old for all of you out there that Legion. <laughs> Yeah, our, our, I know uh, if you're anything like me and are writing your own stuff on the side and can't even conceive of that happening, that's... So, ironically, the 14-year-old's run on the book is when things start to mature some. Yes. And we get the introduction of uh, characters like Pharaoh Lad, Karate Kid, Princess Projectra, and Nemesis Kid, the uh, four Legionnaires that he created. And in that, we get uh, the death of Pharaoh Lad. Pharaoh Lad was the first Legionnaire that... Um, that- Died dies permanently. Yeah, you know, exactly. We had, a, we had the death and resurrection of Lightning Lad before that, which took place over the course of a year. So he was gone for a year and then came back. And fun fact about the death of Pharaoh Lad: actually, America was a little bit of a mess as it is now. But you know, yes, um, and Pharaoh Lad was a masked character that Jim Shooter had every intention of being the first Black Legionnaire, and was told under editorial fiat that that could not happen. And he 
was like, well, then I'm killing him because I'm not going to let you just yank this character around. And I think a lot of comic scholars have debated, you know, the like, what are the implications the, the of pros, doing that? The pros and cons of doing that. Yeah, yeah. But it was a very emotional reaction by a young writer and saying, I can't believe you wouldn't let me do this. I'm not going to let you get any more uh, value out of this character. I'm not going to change my character. Right. To let you do a thing when I think this character is valid. Yeah. And, and I think as from a creative perspective, I, I would assume that, you know, because you can set your own canon for yourself. So it's like if he's gone and he was never unmasked, then yeah, he was black the whole time. You know, right. Yeah. And and then also, like, when I was reading him in the, reading the Legion in the 70s, like, the death of Feralad was, it was huge. And it, not that, it, not I didn't read the issue in which it happened. It was this thing. It was like Barry Allen being dead for three decades. Yeah, or Ted Cord. Or Red Ted Cord, right? Feral Lad was the hero who died, Absolutely. equivalent in the Legion. And it affected everyone because Feral Lad's powers were in, in many ways like Stone Boys, except, you know, like he turned into this, you know, this metal. He's basically like Colossus, but mm-hmm. not with that, without the, necessarily the strength. Mm-hmm. But he ended up sacrificing himself against an absolutely, like, a, a, a solar system destroying creature called the Sun Eater. Yeah, one of the big, big scary villains of the early Legion. Yeah, yeah. And, and so this character who they, who some people were like, is he even good enough to be in the Legion or whatever, ends up sacrificing himself. And it affected psychologically the whole team in a way that was like... the readership, like, I have to assume. Absolutely. Like, so I was like, who is this epic character? What happened? And, like, I hurt for this loss of this character. And so... So I, I hear, I think, I think so many scholars, you know, who are, who are definitely not me, you know, can debate the pros and cons of the choice. Right. And I think it's important to talk about, uh, particularly with the, con- with the reinventions of characters. And I'd be interested to see if they do something with that in, in Legion. Yeah, and I, I mean, in uh, Young Justice. I do know that in the uh, Legion animated series, he's, he's very explicitly white. He doesn't have the, the black the whited out eye holes he has the like it's a hole and you can see the face and the eyes underneath it and it's oh Asian i didn't skin i didn't actually see which that. is an interesting choice for any creator working with that character because you know it's it's they still do the sacrifice story and it's like are we going to throw in a character of color just to have them be sacrificed immediately especially when we don't really have any other main character right because tyrock was only in the background as well Very I think, much right who background. was another yep. yep who was another who was the first black legionnaire right it's, tyrock uh, was that uh, was a whole story a whole bunch of racial politics tied up in that, that yeah that's very very messy and yeah it's, it's some, some nonsense but yeah. um but and then when i was talking about um tom earlier Starboy, and i was saying like wait wasn't it the second Starboy in this story arc i realized what i was thinking of which the because reboot. star star boy was rebooted and he was made he's a, he's a black-skinned character yeah under mark wade's second version of right Legion. right yep. and so for some reason i didn't catch that he had the same first name. I thought that he was either related in some way mm. or was like, had inherited the powers in the way like Invisible Kid did. Sure, because Invisible sure. Kid is another character who for some reason turning invisible was okay, but some of the Legion of Substitute Powers heroes weren't. Yeah. But Invisible Kid also, the the first one ended up dying. Yes. And that was a big deal as well. So uh, anyway, so I think I, I think I got us a little derailed. Oh, no, but, that's fine. Yeah. But let's uh, let's get back to what you were talking about here with the uh, Feral Lad. Yeah, so so this was just an era of of it was towards the end of the Silver Age and we were kind of getting to the point of the Legion starting to touch on the things that it would become really famous for, which are uh, opportunities for growth and change that you could not get in the stagnant universe of the of the DC 20th slash 21st century timeline, where characters have to be kept close-ish to their ages. Right. Right? And like We get Nightwing, and we get things like where some people get to grow and change, but the Legion is, 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 a, is a moving, fluid timeline in a way that that's not. Right. So we start to get that, you know, we're already getting that with the changing roster and the constantly growing group of Legionnaires, but then we get, you know, um, Nemesis Kid, one of those uh, characters created by Shooter, uh, his betrayal of the Legion to the Cuttons, which are essentially the Klingons, because every Marvel and DC comic dealing with anything in space was just shamelessly ripping off Star Trek in the 60s, and it's beautiful and it's great, and you should go look at some of the early Shi'ar stuff in X-Men. Because Oh yeah, actually, just... one of my favorite arcs still to this day, and I have to go back and reread it and see if it still holds up, but was the Brood War, which was a blatant ripoff of the Alien Aliens. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it was really good. Also introducing Lockheed. That's where the dragon came from back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So we could get into that's a whole different <laughs> podcast. But like, yeah. yes. Um, 
Yes. There's a, there's also a lot of connections between yeah, the two teams. So if you like the Legion or you like the X-Men, they're they're very they're, the other one would be a good book for you to Yeah, yeah. Up. And so I think I think it's an important take like remembering the times in which like once the set late 70s hit and you had or the 60s hit with Star Trek and the late 70s hit with Star Wars, mm-hmm. it was it, you know, there's a lot of lightsabers suddenly show up around 1978. Yeah. yeah. Um and so so that's kind of the tail end of that adventure comics era. And then we get into what I'm calling the Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes era when they spin off into their own and that's when things start to really become, we're going to change and we're going to grow and these characters are going to evolve and change. And so like, I've just jotted down just a few instances of that that I think are really significant. Like, um, we start getting members getting married in a way that, you know, like, we, that is a constant battle in the modern DC continuity. People are constantly getting married and then getting divorced or their spouses killed because we want to show them growing and changing and having relationships that move in a, in a way that doesn't feel stagnant but then we can't actually have it change the status quo yeah. because god forbid right? so so i'm gonna i'm gonna just right here this nails one of the reasons why the legion and the titans comic teen mm-hmm. titans comics mm-hmm. meant so much to me not just because i was in the age bracket that these were kind of aimed at at the time because we got this thing i've talked about it on the show over and over the titans None of these teenage sidekick characters had their own comics, right? right? Until Tim Drake's Robin series, which was great, particularly the early runs were really good. I, I enjoyed them. But if you wanted to know what was going on in the characters' lives, like you, you, you needed to read these comics. Like Robin and Batman, you got to see them fight Joker, and that was fine. But you didn't really get to see Tim growing up or Dick growing up or whatever. And the Titans were like that. The Legion was exactly the same way, right? Like, this was our, basically, soap opera. We get to see these characters, right? So Princess Projectra and Karate Kid having this relationship, right? Beautiful romance over so many years and, and, yeah. and influenced by so many of the complicated things that have that influenced their backgrounds. This kid from Earth, son of a, uh, 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 I think, organized crime leader yep. in, in, like whatever, Neo-Japan or whatever the, like, is yeah, that. Yeah, the 30th century, 31st century equivalent. Right, and then, meanwhile, this princess of, of this planet that, because the UP apparently does not observe the um, Prime Directive, is a medieval world that is, you know, they don't have this technology. They're very grounded in, in magic and, and, you know, all of these medieval notions. Right, and Princess Projector was basically an illusionist. Yeah, right? yeah, and wielding kind of like a sorceress thing. Right, and then, but, and then you had, so there were so many relationships, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Night Girl mm-hmm. and and Cosmic Boy, right? The, the the longtime leader of the Legion, right? You have Monel and Shadow Lass, and you have so we also have Lightning Lad and Saturn Girl yeah. getting married, and that becomes a whole big thing. Like I was just rereading the uh, the Darkness Saga, and in there, there's a whole thing where Lightning Lad is in a coma because of this thing that's happened uh, with him. This uh, and there was a thing that happened and right before. Not even just a thing, but I, I, to my memory, it was it was the stress of the job of leading the Legion. It wasn't like he got yeah, injured. In basically, battle. his had, uh, basically his electrical powers were causing uh were causing him to have, go through electroshock yeah. therapy in his brain. And it's and like we, knocking him unconscious. Are we talking about work life balance in this superhero comic and the unhealthy right. ways that that causes us to like affect our own physical health? Right. What? And there was something that happened between Saturn Girl and Timberwolf on another planet, yeah. and it was kind of a misunderstanding, but maybe yep. not. And we weren't really sure what was happening and he whatever his interpretation lightning lads interpretation garth's interpretation of what happened caused him additional stress put him into a coma timberwolf These, who we should note is the uh, at the time the longtime boyfriend of lightning lads own sister to make it Isla. more complicated right 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 so they're in-laws right right so there's this thing that's there's 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 lots going on in this complicated uh ensemble cast that is very very parallel to what we see in Young Justice. And the ways in which they handle the writing of it are similar to the, the ways that uh, Young Justice handles it, too, with the squad designations. It's always with those 70s, really strong Legion stories. It's always, all right, well, you know, Monel's going to take Shadow Lass, uh, Shrinking Violet, Colossal Boy off to on this thing. And they're going to be, they're not going to call it this, but they're going to be Alpha Squad. And right. then, you right. know, Lightning Lad is leading, you know, Saturn Girl, Timberwolf, whoever, off on this other thing. And it all tie together eventually, but we... You're not going to tell an effective story. Like, the, the way they used to talk about with the DC animated universe, they're like, half the time we would just leave somebody out of the Justice League episodes because Seven's a lot of characters and there's not enough for all of them to do. And Legion was just never really concerned with that because it's like, we've got a whole galaxy. There's always stuff going on. We yeah. just split them up and throw yeah. them to different corners and they'll all tie back eventually. Right, but... right, exactly. All right, keep going there. So 
in the 70s, we've got those marriages. We've got those those uh, sort of changes starting to happen. We've got the death of Invisible Kid, which is a big one in that Invisible Kid's been around since pretty much the beginning. He was right. one of the first group of, of Legionnaires to come in. Very 60s costume. very And he's crushed to death by a giant monster. Validus physically crushes him in his fist. Validus, who, for those of you who might have seen the most recent, one of the most recent DC animated, well, maybe not by the time this gets right. released, but... Just as the Justice League versus the Fatal Five, yep. Validus is one of the Fatal Five, and yeah, and it may, it may have been around the first appearance of them as the Fatal Five that that death occurred. Um, and you also get Earth War, which is written by Paul Levitz, who's who's kind of again for X Men fans the the kind of the Chris Claremont of right uh, Legion and a little bit of but he, he was very iconic and had some of the longest running iconic stories. Um, and this was one of the first major multi issue story arcs in comics. Uh, dealing with this war with this alien race that was again kind of ostensibly a Klingons stand-in, but they you know just kind of like oh we're angry, <laughs> right, right? You know, um, and this era also introduces some new Legionnaires, including Wildfire, Tyrock, Dawnstar, and Block. Right. Um, so we've got two kind of alien. Wildfire is a he used to be a human, but now he's energy and he lives in a containment suit. He's very Captain Adam. Actually. Yes, yeah, yeah. He and is. actually, well, he was actually refused entry. And I think I have that issue in this box right next to me where he gets refused uh, en- membership in the Legion. Because he won't use his power. Because he won't use his power. So he's basically Captain Adam, but he knows that he can incinerate things with the energy body he has, and he doesn't want to use that power. So he's like, no, I can fly, and I'm and I'm super strong. And they're like, basically, these are all the powers that we already have on the team. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. And then he ends up sacrificing himself. He ends up uh, pouring all of his energy... Uh, into into a thing and saving everyone when he finally uses his power and they think that he's died. So they think that he's dead for a while and then he recollects himself, learns that he can possess certain people. It's a whole yeah. thing. So for a long, long time, Legion artists will um, show that the situation is serious by blowing up wildfire. Basically. We, you know, it's gotta... basically, uh, it's Red Tornado being torn yes, apart. Yes, right? yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so that way we have one less... Uh, nearly omnipotent legionnaire to try and deal with in the battle, plus we see the stakes. Uh, right, boom, right. Two, two birds, one stone. <laughs> um, and then Block is one of my favorite legionnaires. His powers are real, real inconsistent. I have my own headcanon, of which I choose to accept, but he's a big stone entity. I believe either his species or his planet is called Dryad, one of one of those. And he starts off as a villain um, and, and eventually comes to join the, the legion side, and he's Big and blocky and strong, but what I loved about him was that that was not his power set originally. Now, writer, I, I don't know whether it is a little bit of laziness just because there's a lot of characters to juggle, or whether people have legitimately forgotten about this. But they right. use him for super strength and vulnerability a lot now. A lot. But originally, he, he was a gravity and mass manipulation guy, and so that was why, even though. Uh, you have characters like Colossal Boy who can turn 60 feet tall. He only needs one Legion flight ring because it adapts and it compensates. Block has to wear three because his control over his powers is not the best at first and his uh, mass is constantly shifting. And so the three rings helps him compensate for when that mass is shifting uh, unexpectedly. Uh-huh. And so he can fly and sustain flight. That's so interesting because I have to tell you, Block is not a character that I remember. Wildfire yeah. was big for me. Dawnstar was big for me. Dawnstar, I am, I really am excited to see what the Young Justice take on Dawnstar is. Dawnstar is great. Um, problematic oh, yeah. 70s stereotype. She's, they're from basically a Native American-ish yeah. uh, planet. Uh-huh. She has wings and she has the ability to track things like through light speed, mm-hmm. like through space. And yes. she, it's got some fascinating abilities. She can even fly at light speed with these with these wings. Her and wings she can, are essentially warp nacelles. They basically let yeah. her fly at at right, at and she can survive, and survive in, space. in space. Yeah, yeah. and um, it's actually it's, really cool. It's another one of those things too, where it's like if we're going to look at it from a modern lens, there's a lot of problematic stuff tied up in it. But it's a concept that was that came out of a desire to confront expectations and, and confront norms and confront colonialism in a weird way, right? Because we we've got you know, there's a lot of superhero stories that, that have this concept of what if a population, a marginalized population from Earth, was abducted by aliens hundreds of years ago, put on a new planet, and allowed to develop without colonialism. And so that is what we get with Dawnstar, essentially. Right. It's, it's, it's a native, I don't think they even really give the native tribe any kind of distinction no. um, or any kind of specificity, but it's an, a native tribe from, I think, the North American continent that is taken and placed on right. a habitable asteroid. Right. 
and the costumes are classic, like, like stereotyp- stereotypical old school Native American Star Trek episode kind of stuff. But what's great is that that it's mostly her clothes. I mean, I'm, I, this is an era that like you read more of. So please correct me if I'm wrong. But what I've read more of with Dawn Star, like she wasn't that stereotype. No, In she as a kid, correct. Um, she was very, very strong willed, very much a, a, a leader to some extent, but also very independent. She was the kind of person where it was like, you know, I'm going to provide leadership here. And then if no one's listening to me, it's like, great, I can fly off at hyperspeed on my own. I'm, I'm going to go take care thing. of business, yeah. right? She would yeah. go take care of business, yeah. right? And you look at her and you'd be like, wait, she can just track things and fly really fast. And like, why is she like, oh my gosh, she. I don't know how to describe it. Like my emotional memory of Don Star was like, I was ecstatic when Don was on one of the teams. Right. But the comparing her to another character, for example, like Apache chief. <laughs> right. So yeah. Apache chief had all cause Yes. The clothes was an issue, but then you also had like the, the accent and then, it's very just there's a lot of strangeness going it's on powers, that powers which are like oh yes from this magic bag because all native americans have a magic bag right, with right. changing powder and i am just the only one that's using it <laughs> right, or something right yeah so there were some challenges there that young justice did brilliant i think reinterpretations of a character like long shadow right but with dawn star i agree with you there was like clothing stuff or like her costume was kind of strange but other than that like there was a lot of i think i seem to remember some some solid just care. She was just the character she was, right? And uh, and I think those really kind of changed some things. Where you look at some other characters like Tyrock, Tyrock had sonic powers, but like that era of of Luke Cage, Tyrock, like it, even uh, Falcon. There, it was all Black Falcon, I should say, from back in the day, right? Black Lightning, right? These were all. It was all the same angry black man. Yeah, I really think we should talk a little bit in depth about Tyrock if we, yeah, cause let's, 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 let's bring up Tyrock right now since we're talking about this and we kind of speared off into the, let's do this. Yeah. So, so exact same trope that I was just talking about with the, the marginalized community gets lifted up out of their historical place and, and, and displaced. So, uh, Tyrock, right. the Island, the right? exact same trope. So Tyrock <laughs> forgot about the Island. Tyrock's ancestors were, uh, uh, enslaved Africans on a slave ship as part of the, the transatlantic slave trade. And they, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuzz up some of the details here because, I one, I don't think a lot of the details were really ever nailed down super solidly. But right, also, this right. is not an area that <laughs> invites a lot of fun enjoyment of it. Um, but they basically, they, they took control of the ship that they, that they were um, enslaved on and, and being transported on and, and managed to... Uh, so kind of an Amistad-ish yeah. echo, right? And they end up um, going through an interdimensional barrier at sea to an island called Marzal that uh, exists in an interdimensional pocket that only aligns with normal Earth space every, I want to say, 10 years. It's some kind of arbitrary but long amount of time. And so, oh, wow. Uh, Rich has just pulled out the the issue featuring Tyrock's first appearance where he's standing on the, the, the edge of Marzal and you've got a bunch of, for some reason, very stereotypically dressed 70s African-American characters. <laughs> or not American, but yeah, it's just African. Like, yeah. But again, like, it's like they didn't give them a specific cultural identity, right? I say African American because the way those characters are drawn, that is a very specific 1970s American, like kind of like New York. Like it's like, that woman looks like Misty Knight. That's a drawing of Misty Knight right there. Right. And that's on, on the cover. He's saying, stay out of our city or be slaughtered legionnaires. We despise everything you stand for. And the title is called the hero who hated the legion. Yep. Yep. There you go. So, Tyrock's powers are largely sonic in nature, but the original conception of them was that he had this miracle voice. So different notes, which were represented by different um, letters used in the lettering bubble for when he gives a scream, had different powers. So uh, kind of similar to Halo, actually. Interesting. It was he could one one sound would generate portals, one sound would create a force field, one would allow him to fly like Banshee from the X Men. Uh, one would generate an energy blast, things like that. And again, it was, it was, they set out to create a Black Legion. And in doing so, they just created this in- entire racist fabric behind it because they were approaching it from such a, and, 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 and when I say racist, it's important to, to note that it's like, 
you know, I, I really think these creators were coming at it with the intention of increasing diversity and creating a character that would represent communities that weren't being represented, but they weren't bringing in the voices to be a part of that creative process. They were doing it entirely from their own perspective. And that perspective was so, so skewed by institutional racism. And so it's, you just got this view of what it is to be a black hero and what it is to be a black hero in a utopian future that is supposedly, you know, we're dealing with problems of, of interspecies conflict. Yes. And, and that, that race within species. A hundred planets, yeah. right. Um, and, and you just got this incredibly, every single thing about the background of the creation of Tyrock is just so race and racism. And so you've got um, this trope of the, the, the confident, charismatic black singer, voice of miracles, and, and this kind of we're not going to give him any specificity to really how this works or what happens because it doesn't matter as much as it does with the white scientifically based superhero characters that you know we're used to these formulaic origins of drinking the superfluid or whatever it is. Right, we're just right. going to give him a it's non specific and it's kind of magical because right. this is he has plot powers. Yes, because yeah. it's it's a whatever um, the plot needs that's power he's got. Yeah, what, what is the phrase I'm looking? It's it's a um it's it's an exoticism thing. Yeah, where they don't feel the need to give the, this character the same grounded treatment that they would a white character because it's like, oh, it's this different, radical, unexplainable thing that is blackness in America in the 1970s. And, right. and, that, and that was how these white writers were approaching it. And so you get this island that you know comes into phase with Earth and every 10 years there's conflict because they don't want anything to do with the rest of Earth, which has been explored. It's strange. I, I, I find the Brigadoon aspect of this kind of is actually that part it's kind of interesting. It, and it's been explored since in mildly interesting ways. I haven't read a ton of it, so I don't want to yeah. like say for sure. But I know that some of the ideas that I've heard other people talk about on the internet, sort of kind of the like, yes, these, these people are descended from people who would have been slaves had they not physically overthrown their captors and escaped. And it's like they don't want anything to do with this larger society that has since been built that like regardless of how far we out, how far out we are, regardless of the fact that we're, you know, 1500 years out from where they were this utopian society was built on you know the history of enslaving their right, people and, right, and all right. of these things and and that is kind of interesting but we don't get any of that texture to it in the narrative and also comes, when also we don't get anything else yes right mm -hmm. that is the only representation really we get for the most part as opposed to like even a character like shadow lass who's a character from yes another planet she has darker skin but she's i don't even i don't even look at shadow lass and i'm not even sure she can be a and i i'm not i'm not black yeah. but like i'm not sure if i would look at that and say like yes i could see that being a black identified character but i could be wrong so for oh he's uh, pulling out the for, essay book please <laughs> for listeners that are interested and and are able to get a copy of this essay book that rich mentioned before there's a really great essay uh titled Revisionism, Racial Experimentation, and Dystopia in Giffen's Le oh, wait, no. oh, The Racial Politics of the Legion by Jay Bryson. And, and that kind of touches on the complexity of dealing with race in a context in the real world where race is so significant and a context in the fictional world where by necessity it is less significant because we are completely removed from inter interplanetary politics to, yeah. to an extent it's like in, in in order to or intraplanetary politics sorry because it's we're dealing with the interplanetary we don't have the time to deal with things happening between two different cultures on brawl because we need to deal with the fact that brawl is warring with titan right it's, right it's just that's the scale of it yeah yeah and so you get things like yeah in the early legion we have chameleon boy brainiac five shadow lass and um you know the, these characters who are explicitly drawn as Caucasian featured, and that is referenced in and the... And also happens to be green skin. Yes, and also happens to have the skin. And it, and it explores, you know, well, since then, many writers and, or sorry, many artists have taken the step of taking characters like Shadowlass and saying, let's draw her with more ethnically ambiguous features. And what kind of statement does that make, right? Because it's like, is it right. representation when you're adding those features on one as an afterthought, but also onto an alien? And it's saying, you know, what, what kind of representation is that of all of the... Uh, features of ethnic minorities from real Earth right. are shown through as aliens. Aliens, right? Yes. And this so, is a conversation that we had about about Halo and the yeah. non, her non-binary status and her or her ex exploration of that yeah. non-binary status or the non-binary representation is androids and aliens. And I, what what is 
like, yes, that makes sense. Also, or will we get other things as comics move forward and animation moves forward and other things move forward? Like, will it become when you have this thing with Tyrock, like, yes, this island, this one story, there are some elements in it I can see are very interesting. The fact that it's the only story that we get with a black character until later on when, like, Starboy is, you know, reinvented and things like that. Or you get the reinvention of a character or an or not even reinvention, an invention of a character in, like, Calder, where, like, oh, okay, well, now we're just, now we're getting lots of different stories and this is better, right? This is just happened to be the only story we're getting. And if the only representation you get, then there's a... There's a challenge there, right? And so for many of these reasons, um, because the writers didn't really know what to do with him, the fans didn't really know what to make of him, there was just a lot of offensive stuff going on, uh, Tyrock didn't have much of a role. Yeah. He showed up in that story, he would later join the Legion, but he people didn't know what to do with him, what to make of him, and he was extraordinarily sidelined, and he continues to be extraordinarily sidelined. Right, um, right. Which, again, I don't know... I, I, I don't know what kind of moral value to place on that because it's like we've introduced a lot of characters of color into the Legion world since yep. that are much more compelling and mu- have are much more based in, in interesting takes on their race and yeah. how that plays into like, things. Like uh, Excess I brought up on the show a few times who's a super speed Legionnaire who happens to be distantly related to Bart and yes. to, to Barry. And um, if, um, clearly not Caucasian. Right. And if viewers of the, the Flash TV show uh, are, are familiar, she, she showed up in this most recent season a slightly different version of her as Barry and Iris's daughter, which is interesting because Iris is African-American oh, right. in the show, which she's not in the comics often. So that was an interesting kind of like, she can be the direct daughter of them racially. Right. And, and, oh, yeah. interesting. So yeah, yeah. That, uh, it was an interesting take. There were parts of it I liked and parts of it I didn't. But right, right. Um, for people that are you know interested in, and do like that show, that is a tie-in too. Yeah, so 1970s, complicated race stuff. Legion. Yes. Um, yes. So those are, the, those are the four sort of new characters that we get during that time. And then Paul Levitz leaves the book for a little while. So does Superboy. Things change around in cycle. One of the few major developments that we get during this time is the discovery that, um, so Chameleon Boy, we've talked about the Derlin shapeshifter, real name Reap Daggle. We discovered that R.J. Brand, the financier of the Legion, this kind of old, weird, Texan-American <laughs> seeming guy, right. yes. is actually a Derlin. And... Um, fabricated the identity of R.J. Brand and is actually the biological father. And Reap is his son, yeah. 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 And that is something that, while I don't think it got touched on in incredibly interesting ways at the time, sort of, a lot of really cool stuff has been done with it afterwards. That's fascinating to me because that was, when I was reading, there's something like, talking about missing episodes of Young Justice, right? I was I was literally getting the Legion comics that my brother would randomly pick right. up off the spin rack, right, mm-hmm. and just pick up stuff. I mean, usually it's fine because you get like these, you know, these one shot adventures and stories and you know annuals and things like that. But there were definitely things like like reading like in the Darkness Saga, like it's a it's a thing that Reap is Dar J Brand's son, and like there's a whole thing going on there. And I was like, so I when I was reading, I was like, oh, he adopted. That's nice that he adopted Chameleon <laughs> Boy. But that was kind of that was my headcanon forever because I didn't know what happened because I didn't know the story yet of what happened with R.J. Brand. And so my headcanon is skewed a little bit on that front. So R.J. Brand is one of my favorite parts of the Legion mythos, which I think is a little strange probably for a lot of Legion fans. And it's because I'm such a, um, a continuity nut and, a, and a, as someone that grew up learning things about the world that I love, the comics world, through a lot of Wikipedia and a lot of articles rather than always having the primary sources, I became very invested in making sure that there was a a fluid, uh, a a timeline that made sense. Something that I could latch onto because I didn't have those primary sources. And so like the Hawks drive me bonkers (laughs) because I can't, uh, I can't reconcile. Reconcile. Thank you. That's the word. It's a word I use all the time for the Hawks. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And RJ Brand is a great example of, the ways that you can add flavor and texture to a universe by exploring pockets of it that already exist. Yeah. I want to say, uh, just be, just because we brought up the Hawks real quick, I do want to say that um, after I'd commented, this was going to be a while ago in, in real time in IRL, um, I, had, I commented about this thing with the reconciliation and we had one of our listeners had said, hey, you really should check out the new Hawkman series mm-hmm. that's come out over the last couple of years. 
the DC Universe app runs, I think, about six months behind new comics. And so I just started reading uh, literally the first issue of this new Hawkman comic. And I haven't gotten into a lot of what I think the listeners have been telling us about it yet, but I'm fascinated about it. They say it's really good and does a, does a big step to try and reconcile some of that. So if you've heard me, if you've heard me bag on the, on the Hawks with their origins a lot on the show, go check out that new Hawkman series because I think that's maybe something new. We'll see. I haven't picked up a DC book in a long time. Yeah. The DC Universe app, I'll have to say, has actually been really helpful for me to pick up some of the stuff. Even though we're six months behind, it's 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 still been helping six me Six months catch. is nothing in comics. I know. Wait, I know, right? <laughs> Unless yeah. we reboot again. <laughs> Anyways, so so then we kind of launch into what I call the Paul Levitz era, where he came back and was on the book from 82 through oh, 89, maybe. It was, it was a long run. It wasn't quite Claremont's 17 years on Uncanny, but it was long. And in that time, he almost immediately starts building to his seminal work, The Great Darkness Saga. And that is one that um, we're going to probably talk a lot about in the context of Young Justice and and things there. But um, it set the stage for the transformation of the Legion's world into the sprawling sci-fi worldscape that it it has been. You know, earlier stories begin to imply that that exists. We get the conflict with the Kuns, we get, you know, all of this, but it's very, very limited to the Legion's perspective and directly how they interact with those things. Very yeah. much like, like, it's Earth War. It's Earth is at war, but we don't see really even the military's involvement in this. We see right. the Legion's direct involvement, and they are fighting this war. Um, and Levitz's work through Great Darkness really begins to show us, like, this is a darkness that is consuming and consuming these many different planets with complicated relationships with while bringing back and introducing kind of for the first time to a modern comics audience one of the greatest DC villains of all time right. because Darkseid spoilers I don't know what happened yeah, wait, spoiler <laughs> warning was dropped was featured pretty exclusively and, and check me on this if, if you know me to be wrong in, in the fourth world stuff Jack yes. Kirby's oh no it's all fourth world stuff. he yes, was yeah. not the Superman Justice League yet he was not fighting everybody and their mother over the well actually so actually and and people can go back and please let's go listen to jeff stormer go on and on about it but Mm -hmm. like that introduction when he when jack kirby moved over to dc and they and he asked them uh what's your lowest selling comic and they said jimmy you know superman's pal jimmy olsen he said give it to me let's do this and then he started already dropping seeds of cadmus in the fourth world so there's definitely that tie to Dark Side and Superman happened pretty early, and it was the fourth world stuff, like you were saying. But there's definitely this connection to Superman, but like, which kind of is interesting to me because like when the Great Darkness Saga happened, when it was released, and, and we're reading it, I'm like, yes, this is this is one of those things. It's one of those things that gets written or created, and you go back and think, yes, this was inevitable. Like, why was Dark? It's Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. Superboy, Superman, Legion. Why isn't Darkseid showing? Why isn't Vandal showing yes. up in the Legion? Yes. Right, and that would have huge implications. And the fact that he's not showing up in Legion comics that has its own implications. Guess of- who does though? In a similar vein, we're going to get to see Rayshon Ghoul in a little while. Uh, that was really interesting. That was one that no. I was very excited to talk about. Wow, in the of interesting, Justice. interesting. So. Great darkness. I don't, we can we can maybe save to dive in a little bit later if we want to dive into like the ways that it'll feed into Young Justice. Conclude part two, part three, T minus seven days. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening. And stay whelmed.